Hello everyone! I've got on the screen Elias Tufexis, who's uh, on Skype all the way from Toronto, Canada. I met Elias on the set of The Expanse. I was looking for someone to interview, um, sort of to start some of the pre-publicity for the show, and Elias struck me as the perfect person, not the least because he plays a character who is not in the books. So do you want to talk a little bit about, as much as we can talk about, um, your character Kenzo? Well, to a degree, I mean, he he himself is not. <clears throat> excuse me, is not in the right. books. <clears throat> but the things that his character sets in motion are in the books. Exactly. So he's kind of in a weird way an amalgam of a bunch of little things that happen that become a character. You have to do that sometimes in television mm -hmm. or in film when you're adapting something, because you, you can't. It's obviously not a a medium where you can spend a whole bunch of time saying, and then this happened, and then this happened. So you invent a character to make uh, those connections. But uh, the, the good thing about it is that it's not, he's not just an expositionary character. They turned right. him into uh, uh, <laughs> really, the, I'm trying to not give anything away. But, I know, uh, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, definitely a three-dimensional character with uh, some really... Mm, Interesting things going on that, yeah, we don't want to talk about just right. yet. But he's a great character. He not is. Glam, yeah. and, and for reasons that we cannot state, I think by the end of this first season, he'll be seen as kind of the face of this first season. But um, people who are fans of the books have had concerns about the um, show because people always have concerns. They're always yeah. worried that something that they love is going to be mutilated in the process of adaptation. And so when they see other characters show up with, with new names that weren't in the series... Of course, they're apprehensive about that. Yeah. The thing is, though, your character was actually created by Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham, the two writers who write as James S. A. Corey. It was it was very much their idea to create him in the first place, yeah. and in part, this was after they'd seen you audition and they um, hadn't found a part that was exactly right for you. They started exploring. Okay, so what else can we do? How how else can we sort of flesh out the expanse and also work with Elias? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that was their second. It was their priority was make the show good, work with Elias. Like, <laughs> um, no, it's kind of. I mean, in in a in a way, they wrote the character with me in mind. Kind of. I mean, right. I, the character was there. He was a very small character, just to, like I said, tie uh -huh. kind of storylines together and stuff. Uh -huh. But um, once they came up on the idea to give him to me, I think they kind of wrote him to my strengths right. as an actor because uh, they knew that I was coming aboard and the character became like a, a huge arc that I wasn't uh, expecting when they first called me about it. So that was flattering, obviously, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm really ecstatic about being a part of it because I did audition for two other characters. Mm -hmm. They had me audition for one and I came, came down to meet another guy. The other guy got it, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, then they had me audition for another one, uh, another character, and then they, I think they told me that I'd be spending so much time with uh, Thomas Jane's character mm -hmm. that we kind of, well, we don't really look alike, but we're both like white guys with light skin, blue eyes. And they're like, we didn't want to have uh, Elias looking exactly like Tom walk, spending all this time together. So I think they're like, well, he's not right for that either. And then they came upon the idea to to uh, write Kenzo for me. So it all it's funny how it all worked out. It kind of... Uh, he was he was the best possible uh, outcome for me. Right, and, you know, obviously you don't look that much like Thomas Jane, but it is an incredibly diverse cast. Yeah, exactly. Two white guys would have been an issue. Yeah, would what actually kind of stand out if, yeah. if you guys were together yeah. all the time. And on the first day, I, I was on the set the very first day that you worked on The Expanse. And I remember you saying that when you had heard that they were considering you for another character that they were sort of writing for you, your first reaction was, great, is it going to be security guard number three? Did you take a line from security guard number two and, <laughs> and yeah. hand it over to me? Which I guess you, you've said um, that happens. Yeah, that happens a lot to actors when you, have, you can go in for an audition and do uh, really, really well, but you just don't fit the part. And then they throw you a mercy part, is what we call it in the, in the business. So a lot of times, I've, I've, I've turned down many, mm -hmm. where I've done a really good audition for a show or a film, and then I remember one I did was something like 
15 pages right. for a film, and, and I, I killed the audition. I did really, really well, and it went to actually uh, the son of one of the actors in the actual film. So I had no chance at all before right. I auditioned. Right. And then they called me and they said, uh, oh, you can play this part. And the line was, uh, hey, the phone's for you. And didn't they want you to audition again? That's true, yeah. They wanted me to audition for that part. Right. I was like, no, I'm not even, I wouldn't even take the part if they offered it. Secondly, right. I'm not going to audition for, you have 12, 15 pages of me auditioning. Right. Just, you could figure out that I could say phones for you. Right. But that's the way the business goes sometimes, which is why The Expanse is so refreshing uh, for an actor. And then once I got to know uh, Ty Frank and, and uh, uh, the rest of the showrunners and writers, you realize that these are guys who care about performances and mm -hmm. uh, character and realism and uh, that kind of thing. So they want to hire actors that they know will give a certain type of performance. Um, so they respect actors is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, they, so nice that they seem to respect every, I mean, every part of the creative process. I, I get the impression that there's a lot more being invested in the series than you would typically see um, in a television series by producers whom you've never, you never heard of before, who came over from um, writing novels. And, yeah. and they really have done a, a first class production. Now, that's the only set I've ever seen. But in, in your experience... Well, yeah, you were on a big soundstage, and that was actually the second biggest soundstage we used on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you remember how big it was, take that, and then we did it. We were inside, we were on a, well, I don't want to say where we were, but we were, they expanded it to, no pun intended, right. uh, to a massive, uh, massive world that they created. Um, we were on some really big sets, and there was a lot of money. There is a lot of money poured into it, and... Um, just to go to, to show you how much effort is put into it, one of the writers uh, and showrunners, because there's Ty and Frank who wrote the uh, Ty, Ty, Ty yeah. and Frank, Ty, 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 Ty Frank, Frank and Daniel yeah. wrote the novels, and um, uh, they wrote a, a few of the episodes and they oversaw everything. Right. Uh, but there's also the uh, other co-producers, uh, which is Hawk and Mark, mm -hmm. and <laughs> during Super Bowl weekend, I went over to hang out with. Uh, with some of the cast at their hotel room or at their apartment that they rented, and the entire Super Bowl they were writing. Oh, yeah. the entire, I was like, "You watching the game? Are you writing?" Like, "No, I got to ride. I got to ride." <laughs> and and it wasn't like a deadline thing. It was just they were just making sure everything was really good. Uh huh. Because they're, like, they're really, really, they really wanted, you know, they really wanted to get everything great, and they got so you got millions of dollars per episode. I don't know the actual budget, but it was a lot. Uh -huh. They got um, huge sets. Great cast. They, they built a great cast. That was one of the things for me that when I saw the, the cast, I was mm -hmm. really mad that I didn't get on mm -hmm. initially. So I was like, oh my God. Like, I love Thomas Jane. I've loved him for a long time. Uh -huh. And Jonathan Banks. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, you're all these great actors. Yeah. And Shore, who I can never pronounce her last name. Right. Uh, right. And uh, she's a wonderful actress. And then there's like people I knew, right? Like Cass, I've known for a long time. Uh -huh. Cass Ampar. And uh, and then you meet. I met everybody else, and they're all wonderful people. Right. But but uh, yeah. Once I saw that cast, I was like, man, I can't believe I didn't get that part. I was so mad. Right. And that just goes to show you, for actors out there, you never know. Because I left that audition, and I talked to Mark about this. I left that audition, and I thought Mark hated me. Oh really? I, I was like, because oh. I did the original audition, they gave me a callback, and I went in and did the callback, and. Uh, I, th I think I remember something about I came up with some idea for the character and Marge was like, no, right. no, no, that's not how it is. I was like, oh, okay. And then I did the audition the way he wanted. And then I left there going like, well, I didn't get that. Right. And it just goes to show you that I didn't get it, but I was always on the radar for every time a character that mm -hmm. fit my age range and race and everything that I could play. It's crazy. Well, and, you know, people hear about the large budget, and that's not always reassuring, because as people know, just throwing a lot of money at something isn't necessarily a guarantee of quality. In fact, sometimes it's quite the opposite. Right. But, but I have to say, every aspect of the, I've seen of this show, it seems like they're going for quality. They really are. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I throw in the budget because it's rare for television. Yes. Uh, particularly for science fiction television is... Um, at the risk of insulting other sci-fi shows, uh, I don't mean the network, I mean science fiction right. shows. Um, normally, they'll 
they'll be like, okay, this is your set, your little Star Trek Enterprise bridge here. Mm-hmm. You can't really go anywhere else because we can't. Or you can do like a little location shoot or something. But right. that's what the money that science fiction shows normally get. Right. Unless you get into a Battlestar Galactica type show. And they're like, this is really good. Let's throw some actual money so we right. get some great effects and great production value. And that's what they did here. I would walk into these things and be like, that one I was telling you about, the, the really big sound stage that we use here in Toronto. Uh, when I walked in, 360, 360 degrees, you looked around and it was, you were on this, well, in this set, in mm-hmm. this place, I should say. Um, and they had it, every detail was like, down to the, down to the smallest little detail. It's really really cool to see. And like I said, I've done a lot of science fiction shows. Mm-hmm. That's kind of rare. Well, really and rare. so a three sixty set like that is that of an advantage to the actors as well as the camera work and, and all of that to be able to be sure. sort of immersed. Sure, like I mean, to a degree. I mean, the more you can surround yourself with actual sets and props and things. I do, I do a lot of video game work, so a lot of my life is on a, yeah. an empty stage. Right good performance capture so i'm kind of used to using my imagination for things uh but it definitely helps i think more than anything it helps the director and just you can be like point the camera almost anywhere uh-huh. and you don't have to worry about catching no the set ends here didn't happen on this show right but when we're there's a ship that that i spend a lot of my time on i'm on the ship like you just you walk up to this huge thing built on a sound stage and you go inside the ship or on a planet, or it's it's pretty incredible. So, approximately, how many days did you end up working on the experience? days? I don't recall. I did five episodes, which I think became four in the cut, or vice versa. I did four, which I think became five. I guess we'll find out. Right. Is you end up, you know, the the show is not like a one, like not every episode is a one off story. Right. It's a long arcing story, right. so. As far as I know, I did on paper four, I think, or I think I did, I don't remember. But I show up in episode six, and I'm there till the end of the season. Mm-hmm. I may miss an episode there or two, but uh, not, not two, but I may miss an episode somewhere, but it uh, depends on how they cut it together. Because mm-hmm. they don't have to cut it by script, right? If they right. deem this is a better ending at this point, then right. that's what they'll go. Right. So... Well, see, I'm excited to see, too. I've seen some of it when I've done some uh, additional dialogue for it. Uh-huh. But it's all been kind of, you know, special effects not done, lighting right. not done, and it still looks incredible. Yeah, I I saw the pilot before the special effects were done. Oh, yeah. It's all the green screen and people still wearing their rigs when they're doing their wire work uh, <laughs> to be weightless. And, yeah, it still looks fantastic. So yeah. the pilot has been screened at this point at um, Comic-Con in San Diego and the New York Comic-Con. Yeah. And then we're just waiting for it to actually air on December 14th on Sci-Fi. Yeah, and so far it's been a great, great reaction. I've, I've not seen one negative, even my, minor, like, everything's been way positive. Which is, I haven't seen, yeah, I haven't seen one thing that was like, yeah, it was okay. I've seen, I've, they're all been like, wow, this is incredible. Which it's is just, like, which is yeah. unusual, and especially uh, for a series that um, is so beloved in book form. It's just there's yeah. always somebody who's going to say, well, the book's are better. Oh, I didn't like this. I didn't like that. But you know what? There seems to be such overwhelmingly positive support from the fan base transitioning yeah. over here to television. I can use my experience watching Game of Thrones with my wife, who's read all the books. Right. And she's she was <laughs> before the show came out, I didn't know what Game of Thrones was, but I knew uh-huh. that something was taking my wife away for like hours <laughs> at a time. Right. And it was like the Game of Thrones, she would just read them religiously and when the show started, she would be like, well, that's not, that didn't happen. That I don't even know who this character is. And then by the end of the season, she'd be like, that was amazing. Uh-huh. That works better than the book. You right. know, that kind of stuff. So it happens. Yeah. Uh, and I think if, as long as the show shows respect to the story and tries to get to the same place, and respect to the characters and things like that. I mean, personally speaking, when I watch something, I'm a huge comic book fan. If I see right. something that's better in a film than would be in the source material. I don't get mad because it's not like the source material. Right. You know, like Heath Ledger's Joker, when I'm for right. a reaching high example. Right. It's nothing like the comic books, really. His performance, at least. But it's mind-bogglingly good. Yeah. And so, I, I don't know how you do it on a, in a comic book, to be honest. Yeah. It'd be I kind mean, of difficult yeah. to get <laughs> I mean, down The Joker's a very uh, interesting character. But this, I mean, this is... But like Jared, 
Jared Leto's Joker that's coming out now. Uh-huh. A lot of people are complaining about it and saying, well, I don't like this, I don't like that. But I'm looking at it going, it's just another interpretation right. of the character that's been interpreted. If you include cartoons, dozens of times. Well, and, I mean, the poor guy, he's following Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger. And Heath Ledger. I mean, <laughs> cut the guy a break. <laughs> one person's won three Academy Awards. One person <laughs> won it for playing the Joker. Right. So you can't really win. Well, and yeah. so did you know um, Ty Frank's connection to Game of Thrones? I knew it, yeah. I yeah. knew it. I learned about it later that he, I think he was George R. R. Martin's assistant, right? Yes. And yeah. so he was actually there on the set um, of the first season. Oh, cool. And so, you know, he, so he, he had seen that process. Um, the relationship over HB is a little bit different. The show creators are just big fans of George. And so even though they're not con- contractually obligated to, they, they give him all kinds of feedback. Right, they let yeah. him give all kinds of feedback and input. Um, but the expanse is unheard of. I mean, none of us in the fiction writing world have ever seen a deal like this um, where both the writers of the books are actually producers on the right. show, and yeah, and yeah, yeah. one the thing about yeah, James most of the time you sell it. To the yeah, you you people. you know you kiss your rights goodbye. You hope that it sells to fans. You hope that you know they they yeah. love your books and will respect um, your source material. But here you've actually got the writers working on the show, and I don't know of any other deal like that. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, and See, they were there almost every day. At least one of them was. Yeah. Almost every day. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing about you uh, is that Ty especially Ty Frank, um, already knew about your work. You know how people will say, this is the best actor you're not watching? You're an example of the best actor that people are watching, but they don't necessarily realize that they're watching you um, because you do a lot of motion capture. So why don't you talk a little bit about what you're most famous for? Uh, well, I don't, I don't do a motion capture in, in films yet. I, at least I haven't. But I, I've done... Oh, that's not true. I've actually done one. Yeah. But um, the, I've done... Uh, mostly video games mm-hmm. and the things I'm most popular for are games like uh, the Assassin's Creed series I think I'm in four of them uh, I play Adam Jensen in the Deus Ex series kind of a big deal which is kind of a big deal for sci-fi fans yeah. which is why I think Ty knew who it was he had played that game Yeah. and uh, yeah he's a big fan of that game the game is very um, it's, it's a little bit of a niche but it's popular mm-hmm. enough Mm-hmm. Because it's cyber renaissance kind of thing, and uh, yeah, it's it. In an odd way, it took my career in this uh, unintended direction because I just auditioned for it like I do for everything else, and mm-hmm. it happened to be the lead character, and the game happened to become very popular. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, based on the strength of that, sometimes I get other shows, and I do a lot of conventions and mm-hmm. uh, things like that, and then. Couple that with you know my appearances on Smallville and Supernatural and thing I've kind of become this I don't know geek uh, <laughs> geek god but yeah. I mean, in a good way I love geeks yeah. I'm a geek so yeah. it's like uh, uh, yeah I, one of those guys that you know you go to a convention and people won't walk by me and sometimes I'll be like I recognize that guy but then they'll come to it you know my the day I'm set up. They'll see my booth the big, you were in that, you were in that. Oh, right. you're the voice of this or the, you're the guy who performance captured that. And that's my career. And that's fine with me. I love that. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I think, I don't think people realize uh, with video games exactly how much of uh, the actor's work goes into the video game. I think people still think of it in terms of like animation where you do the voice work, somebody else does the animation. And it's not like that at all, I gather. Um, not for big games, like AAA games. Uh, they're called, I guess you can call them the big budget games like Deus Ex mm-hmm. or Assassin's Creed or things like that. What you do normally is you performance capture. Anytime there's an actual scene, almost anytime there's a, it varies, but almost anytime that you see a character, that character's performance captured from head to toe. So you put the tight Lycra suit on, you got markers all over every part of you that articulates, you got a little camera on your head uh, pointing at your face, mm-hmm. a very small camera. You got, sometimes you have dots all over your face too, and there's a mic on the camera, so you're really you're capturing everything at the same time, the voice, the performance, the face, and it does make a huge difference if you can do that. Sometimes, you know, there's a character that's just uh, too big for a human to play. Right. So they'll cast, sometimes they'll cast 
in Deus Ex now that we, we have a really big character and they cast a different actor for the voice than they did for the body. Because the guy who did the body is not really much of an actor, he's more of a, of a wrestler. Mm-hmm. So they hired him and they're like, we're not going to use him, we're going to use somebody else. That happens too. But now for the most part, they're casting it like films. And they're bringing in actors to uh, do everything at the same time. So, yeah, so you're doing the, the dialogue and the actions and, yeah. and everything. And so you're, doing cap- a, you're basically doing a film. And the, instead of capturing it with a film camera, they're capturing it with a uh, digital camera. Not digital, but uh, cameras that capture data. Mm-hmm. So it's capturing every little movement that your face does. Mm-hmm. They capture it. Think of, you know, uh, Plan- Dawn of the Planet of the Apes or Avatar or mm-hmm. Gollum. Right. Uh, and think about how that technology keeps growing. Every time I go in, literally every time I go in, something is new. Mm-hmm. There's a new thing that makes the camera lighter, or suddenly now they're putting dots on me, and then they weren't, and now the dots are in different places, things like that. It's a, I'm going in next week for a week to do it again, and I, I can't wait to see whatever new right. thing they come up with now. But as far as sets go, you're saying it's usually kind of an empty room with, like, tape on the floor. For the most part, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they'll tape off where you shouldn't walk. Mm-hmm. Like, That's a table. So mm-hmm. you don't walk through that tape because then your character's walking through a table. Right. Um, I mean, sometimes they'll bring it. Like, the other day I did one where I jump off of a helicopter that lands. So all I was doing was standing there on a bench uh-huh. uh, and a riser on the bench. I'm just standing there and I make us like a body thing like I hit the ground mm-hmm. when I jump off of that. And then I see they animate it as it's a big helicopter coming down and jump out. It's um it's a new it's a new world with that kind of thing. There there is a star system in video games. Uh-huh. And there's like ten of us that are name video game actors. Right. Like if this person is in the game it draws attention to the game. Right. You know, like um, Nolan North and Roger Craig Smith and uh, Troy Baker, Jennifer Hale, me, Mm -hmm. things like that. I think it brings a name. But I don't think that video game companies embrace it yet Mm -hmm. because I don't think they realize it yet. I've already been in trouble for promoting games when I wasn't given permission to do so. Mm -hmm. And then when they see what that brought to the game, I'm instantly forgiven. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we didn't give you permission to talk about it. And I said, well, look what happened mm-hmm. on social media and look at all the companies, right. the, the gaming sites that ran with it. And then they're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, keep talking about it. You know, like that kind of thing. When so, I, I remember when you were on the set of The Expanse, you were talking about stuff that, of course, we can't talk about, but um, project video game projects you were working on. And one of the issues was that um, because you were so well-known they were actually considering not having you take the lead in a certain franchise. Right, no, they did. Um, I, I've since been told this wasn't true. I asked the guy just recently if that's what happened, and he's like, no, 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 we just decided to redo the game. Right. But, you know, and it was Ty, yeah. Ty Frank who was, who was saying, well, but in film you don't hear people say, oh, you know, we've yeah. had a lot of Tom Cruise hits. We, you know, we don't necessarily want to cast the guy again. You never hear that. Right. Uh, but I... At, in their defense, at that point, uh-huh. DSX had just come out, and it wasn't it wasn't really a name uh-huh. yet. I had done a couple of video games. Uh, but now, I mean, obviously now it's not a problem. I'm doing right. two, two leads in two games that come out on the same day. Oh, wow. They so. both come out on February 28th. Far Cry Primal and DSX, uh, Mankind Divided. And I'm the lead character in both of them. No, but it just goes to show how much the industry is evolving. I mean, because yeah. these issues are coming up, you know, sort of very in rapid succession. Because it's only a few years ago that wasn't most video game just sort of what voice work or yeah. motion capture, and and now what we're yeah, seeing now. Yeah, when I first started, the, I was ca- I was doing the voices for the actual programmers who were doing the performance capture. Oh, okay. It was, <laughs> it was all like this, you know, like that kind of thing. But <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> And we've all and played games If you watch video like games that. from like 2007 when motion capture started, 2008, uh-huh. you start seeing like, oh God, this is terrible. <laughs> and now it's much more like everything's kind of just, they're trying to get everything just subtle and realistic. I mean, depending on the game, but yeah, for the most part. Um, how many hours of work is it 
typically for, <laughs> to play the lead on one of these video game franchises versus playing the the lead in say a feature film? It depends on that. It depends, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're thinking feature, if I've done some features where I've been, you know, like number two or three on the call sheet, like a month and a half of work, two months, mm -hmm. depending on the on the show, for the most part. Uh, for video games, depending on the game, like Far Cry, we've been working on it for two months, but Deus Ex, I was working on for two years. Yeah, because there's a it's lot not, of content. It's not every day, but it's mm -hmm. like a game like Deus Ex. Do you remember those Choose Your Own Adventure books when yep. we were kids? Yeah. It's like a version of that. Right. So I have to either performance capture or record right. 20 possible outcomes for every character I need. Right. So it takes a long time. Uh, by the end of a four-hour session, I'm dead. My voice is dead. <laughs> How would you compare a typical day on the set of a video game versus on the set of a television? And I understand there's not really typical days because because yeah. projects vary so much. But as well, the difference is if you're talking performance capture, the difference is uh, the great difference for actors is that you get there at eight and you finish at five uh, because the programmers and the people who are capturing you and running all the computers and stuff they are nine to fivers. Mm -hmm. They're not like on film, which is you get there at five, you finish at eight p.m. Right. You know, because you're you're just going, and sometimes you're going until daylight runs out. Sometimes you're going until you've reached thirteen hours, because that's the like the limit is how far you can go. Sometimes you go further, and then producers don't like it, but because they have to pay get paid a lot more money. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, your hours in film or or in TV are are terrible. Which I well, noticed is like, like I want the no, I want to be the star of the show, uh -huh. and it, that's really difficult. Uh -huh. People don't really understand that. If you're, you know, uh, if you're James Gandolfini uh -huh. doing Sopranos, you're working fifteen hours a day, right? Going home, working on your lines, going back fifteen hours, like right. you don't stop. Uh, sort of great. That's what's great about a show like Expanse because they're probably Game of Thrones too. There's so many characters. Mm -hmm. That some act, every actor is going to have some time off. Right. Well, if they're working on another kind of storyline. Well, uh, you know, my one day on the set of um, The Expanse, I noticed that it went really late and um, it went even later than they had planned. One of the actors was, um, this was, I think, his first time in a, a while in a role where he had these kind of big, long soliloquies. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. We won't yeah. say it. Yeah, 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 no, and he's great. I mean, he's fantastic. Um, oh, yeah. But so, anyway. Uh, it took a long time, and yeah. I remember, you know, you showed up at a certain time, and it was hours before it was time for your, your Yeah, you know what work. was annoying about that? I had been booked on another role, another sci-fi show called uh, Dark Matter, uh -huh. and they uh, called The Expanse and said, do you think he can do it? Like, it was shooting on the same day, and they said, do you think he can uh, he can do this? And Expanse was like, yeah, maybe, and then by the time I was there, uh -huh. it was rolling, I was like, not going to happen. Right. Not going to be able to do this other character. Right. Luckily, they had a backup, but uh, they had a backup plan. I don't know what they did, but right. yeah, couldn't do it. I couldn't do the both shows because right. you just take so long. It takes so long. Right. So it's his fault, huh? Boy, yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, so I I can say what I saw you do on the Expanse. I think I won't get in trouble for that. Um, you we were the very last scene shot that day. You hit a mark and you turned and you looked at the camera. I didn't look at the camera. Did I look at the camera? Um, I, no, I look at I can uh, only see uh, the little screen, so maybe it was... Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you did two takes and you were done. Nailed yeah. it. <laughs> this is really hard. But you were you were <laughs> on the set for several more hours than that. Yeah, I got there at whatever time, and then like eight hours later I did that. That's what... There's your big difference. You don't do that in, in video games. In video games, you get there, you pretty much start right away once you get all suited up and they'll schedule you to the point where you're like, you're just going to be here all day. Cause you don't have to wait for lighting. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait for hair and makeup. Um, if somebody's really screwing up their lines, you can actually kind of have them off camera and then just not animate the eyes moving. Uh -huh. you know, like if I'm looking here uh, and I'm looking here, but it's my face is still added here and I'm reading, they can just pop my eyes back there. Right post so it's not that big of a deal um 
So yeah, there's all these little time savers. That's not to say there's not always going to be computer problems where it's like this doesn't work. Oh, we got to reset. That kind of thing. Freeze. I don't know why the sound's not working. That kind of stuff happens too. But you never have. And then here's the big thing: is you never have to relight. That's what takes so long in a day. It's like if you and I are doing a scene. Most people watching this probably know this, but if you and I are doing a scene, they cover me. They have to light me in a certain way. Right. They cover you. They have to turn around all the lights. Sometimes they take a set and move it. And, mm-hmm. uh, but on video game, you don't have to worry about any of that because all of that in post. So we just do it like a play for the most part. Right. Uh, I very rarely have to worry about marks. Mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about blocking the actor from the other camera. You know, uh, that kind of stuff because it's all... The, here's a really interesting thing. The director, I've seen him do it. We'll go in, we'll record the day. Uh, he'll come in after the day is over. He'll have a little box camera, which is not really a camera, a monitor, I should say. Mm-hmm. And wherever he points it, he sees what we've already done. Oh, cool. So he could say, okay, let's roll this scene. And that could point it and just pick his camera angles after we're done. It's incredible. You that watch incredible. the scene, there's nobody there, but you're watching what was there. At that point. Wow. So the director just goes, okay, from this time to this time, I want this angle. From this time to this time, I want this angle. So you don't ever have to, you don't have to keep actors late. You don't have to. Right. You just do it. That's the, the blessing about that. The trick about being an actor is that you're, you're working against another actor and nothing. Right. The guns are plastic little toy guns. Right. The table's uh, a taped off place on the table floor. Taped off, things like that. Yeah. Do you... So, did you have, get any idea of what like the room looks like or, or anything? Sure, they'll show you a lot of times. They'll show you. Sometimes they're advanced enough where they'll show you. Uh, I've I've done it where I've seen my character, I've seen Adam Jensen, mm-hmm. on the screen. Wow. As I'm moving, he's moving. You know that kind of thing, and then they're like, "Okay, now you're on this set." So I'll walk, and if I walk where it's taped off, I can see myself walk through a table. Through a table, or yeah. Right. So you can see the set for the most part. And if it's not up there, then they'll always have, like, a diagram for you. Right. Things like that. Like, this is what it looks like. Because you have to think about things like, how far are we? How big is the room? Right. You know, sometimes, actually, because of the way the room could be in the game, hundreds of feet longer than the room you're in. Mm-hmm. So you have to take that into account. If the actor could be 30 feet in front of you, but you're yelling like he's 100 feet in front of you. Right. So things you have to think about. So, um, so it's, it's all fun. I mean, it's all really cool. Well, so, I think it's stuff that people don't think about. And I think a lot of people don't know that, you know, in television or uh, in film, that if you've got a scene with six people talking, that's a lot of shooting and relighting and getting yeah. everything. Table right scenes there. are notoriously, like, the worst yeah. thing to shoot. Because not only do you have to worry about lighting and things like that, you got to worry about eye lines to mm-hmm. make sense on once you cut everything together. Because right. like, you're looking here. I, I've done, I remember doing a love scene where because of the way the cat, I couldn't look at the girl, I had to look next to her. Uh-huh. So this beautiful girl standing here, and I'm like supposed to be admiring her, and I'm looking to the left, of her, to the right of her, right. to my left, because I'm like, I, the camera didn't work. The right. angle didn't work. So that kind of stuff, you don't really have to worry about when you're performance capture. I've yet to performance capture a love scene. Uh-huh. Might happen. It happens in games now. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, and hope it's, you know, somebody that doesn't need a whole lot of CGI to look good afterwards. No, sorry, it's a horrible thing to say. <laughs> We're all in black suits with dots all over us. So. You know, a lot of people have no idea how to go about becoming an actor. And, you know, unfortunately, it's portrayed in our society sometimes almost like a, a fairy tale. Or Cinderella type, you get discovered in a pizza joint yeah, uh, by somebody. And, you know, but, you know, so practically speaking... Ha- how did you become an actor? Because there's probably as many stories as there are actors. Sure. I mean, I, I really went about it in a very kind of unexciting way. I mean, in, initially I went about it in a very exciting way, but it didn't work. So I went to, um, I went to theater school in Montreal, um, English theater school. I know people think Montreal is all French. Um, I went to theater school in Montreal for three years graduated, did some plays around town, French festivals, things like that. Um, did a couple of auditions. I remember auditioning for a 
Charlie's Theron movie, like way, way back, didn't get it. Uh, it was a small part, didn't get it. Started, you know, auditioning here and there, but I still never booked anything. I booked a commercial for um, an anti-rust, a local anti-rust. So like, commercial. like what Lightning McQueen has in, sure. in cars. Yeah. It was like, yeah, it was like, uh, <laughs> exactly. That was exactly it. Right. Except that was prestigious. Sorry, we we like both have local, small children, and yeah, so yeah, no, no. <laughs> It was a local thing, local anti-rust, metropolitan anti-rust. Uh -huh. And uh, I got paid 600 bucks, and I bought a DVD player with it, uh, which was huge for me. Uh, that was my first paid gig. And then I remember I just, I booked, <laughs> the funny actor story, bad advice, don't do this, but I applied for a job at, it doesn't exist anymore, it used to be a magazine store called... Uh, 10,000 magazines or something like that. It was just a magazine store. And uh, I applied for a job to be a cashier there, and I got it. Mm -hmm. And my first day of work clashed with an audition for a, a touring theater. Mm -hmm. I didn't go. I went to the audition. Mm -hmm. I called it sick or something. I don't remember what I did. And luckily, I got the part in the audition. So I never had to do that million comics job. And then I, so that audition was also very cheap. I got paid like 500 bucks a week to um, go all across Eastern Canada to schools mm -hmm. to do plays. Like one of those for young kids mm -hmm. where I played Frank the Frog. And, uh, Every actor's once. dream? Yep. <laughs> it was good. It was a musical. I got to sing. I, my Frank the Frog was a Joe Pesci impression. Cool. So that was always fun. Um, and there was one for teenagers for schools. So I got to tour all around Newfoundland and Labrador and uh, Nova Scotia and all these parts of Canada. Very, really beautiful too. Mm -hmm. And then I used that money, which ended up being about two grand, to move to New York. Um, don't do that. <laughs> it was very, I mean, I say don't do it, but it was a very uh, educational time in my life because I moved mm -hmm. there with $2,000. At the time, the Canadian dollar wasn't very good, mm -hmm. so it got cut down to like a thousand dollars. Right. So thinking about that now, it actually blows my mind. I moved right. to the New York from Montreal illegally. Oh yeah. Thousand dollars. Yeah. And I lived there for like seven months. Wow, that's and stretching a dollar. Yeah. Well, I didn't. Yeah. Right. Thousand dollars disappeared pretty quick. Right. I, do all these little under the table jobs at coffee shops and yeah. wandering the streets selling stuff. Well, because uh, isn't it a challenge as an actor to be able to do a day job because you need to do auditions and, and all of these things that yeah, most that's employers the tricky don't part understand. Of being actors, try to find a job like that gives you um, the opportunity to do it. That's why so many actors are waiters mm -hmm. because your scheduling is nine to five. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are night shifts. For a lot of them. And if you, I've never done the waiter thing actually. But I did a lot of movie theaters, ushers, things like that, where probably, I probably would have made a lot more money as a waiter. But, uh, you know, I, I wanted I love movies. I wanted to be surrounded by movies, so I worked at Paramount Theater, mm -hmm. carrying tickets for seven bucks an hour or whatever right. it was. Um, and I actually, this is the best actor story, is that, so I'll get to it, but I, I moved to New York. I didn't have any money. I was doing plays off, off, off Broadway. But it was an experience. It was a great experience. Ran out of money, came back to Montreal, lived with my grandmother because I had, like when I say I had zero dollars, I mean like zero. Right. I had no money left. And while I was there, I got this job at Paramount, starting to get a little bit of money. And uh, I did an audition for a sci-fi film. I got a call back, and the call back interfered with my work. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go to work. Mm -hmm. I went to the call back. Mm -hmm. And it was the second lead of a feature film, wow. a sci-fi film. And I booked it. And they fired me because I didn't go to the callback. Because, excuse me, because I went to the callback and I didn't go to work. They fired me from the Paramount Theater. And the first place the movie played was the Paramount Theater. Oh, how funny is that? <laughs> I, got, I got to go back to the Paramount Theater for the premiere in Montreal. Right. People who fired me because I went to that audition. Right. Uh, <laughs> Which doesn't happen to them often, I, I, I would yeah. bet. Um, but uh, that's not to say that you should do that. I'm just saying that uh, that happened to me. And then I ended up, so I booked that role. It was just, uh, it was a Canadian film, but it was a feature. It was a good, uh, mm -hmm. it was a good experience. And that was the most, 
that was my first big anything, and it was like second lead in a film. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I learned a lot, and I watch it now, and I'm like, it's, it's terrible because I was learning everything at that time. Right. And I was only like 26, and uh, I used that money, and I moved to a place where there's more work, Vancouver, mm-hmm. because Vancouver has a lot of uh, Smallville was there, Supernatural still there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oh, there's so much stuff. There's just so much, so many American shows there. Yeah, I mean, the joke was you have to move to L.A. so they can send you to Vancouver to work. Yeah, as an actor. a lot of friends moved to L.A. and then end up shooting in Toronto. Vancouver, and Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, it's just cheaper. And we have big, like, <clears throat> especially in Toronto, we have big, uh, big sound stages. Montreal, too, there's really big sound stages. So it's cheaper for them, plus we have everything they need. And some tax uh, credits to boot. Yeah, exactly. So I moved to Vancouver and I just started auditioning and auditioning and auditioning and after playing a lead in a film I didn't work again for a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, well, I did. I had a small role on Smallville where I said two words mm-hmm. and uh, that was a big eye-opening experience for me because it was, you know, I went from every day going working 30 days to working three hours mm-hmm. on, a, on a big show. Uh, but, they, but it grew and it grew and I just kept, you know, you get to know the cast and directors and it grew and grew and grew. You know, eventually I started getting bigger roles and bigger roles and then I came out here to Toronto because I wanted to be closer to my family back home. Then I started working the video games and mm-hmm. man, it was just a workman way of getting a, a career. If you minus the living in New York <laughs> and starving to death for a year. Well, of the people you went to theater school with, how many of you have... Um, There's careers. 40 of us that graduated, and I think two of us work, mm-hmm. three. Uh, one of my buddies, uh, Sasha, he's one of the leads on Grin. Uh, he and I went to theater school together. Mm-hmm. Other than other than he, he and I, I mean, they, they all kind of work sporadically, but for mm-hmm. the most part, the ones that made big careers out of it, it's two or three of us. Right. Yeah. And I don't like... That's not really. A, it's not to say that that's a talent thing. It's just right. about, like it's a perseverance thing. Mm-hmm. You kind of really have to, if you know you're you're good at it, you'll you'll know you're good. Mm-hmm. If you if you go into auditions and the feedback you get, and you're not trying to convince yourself that they don't know what they're talking about, right? Then you realize that okay, they they know they think I'm good. Maybe I'm good. Mm-hmm. And then if you know you're good, you just keep going because eventually it's going to happen. Right. There's, the thing about, especially if you're watching this in Canada, the tricky thing about Canada is that you have to wait for projects to come in mm-hmm. to the country and they have to come in with characters that need to be cast mm-hmm. that fit you. Mm-hmm. That's why a lot of us, including me, we go to L.A. because everything kind of gets filtered through there. Mm-hmm. No matter what. So you go to L.A. because you, you're hitting everything. But if you're living in Canada, you kind of kind of got to wait for things to come in. You got to hope. I hope there's something I can play on this show. I hope there's something I can play on this show. And then you got to book that thing. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of hurdles if you're... Uh, that's why video games have been such a blessing for me. Because anytime I wasn't doing a TV show, some sort of video game would pop up. Mm-hmm. And voice work. I do a lot of commercials, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, voice commercials. And do you still do much stage? No. I I would love to do stage again, but to be perfectly honest with you, the amount of time put in, I'll make more in a day. I made more today mm-hmm. than I would in two weeks doing a stage production. Uh, I mean, unless even if you have the lead, really, you don't make that much. Mm-hmm. It's only it's only you know it's economics. You can't help it. Right. They can't pay you what a video game pays you. Right. Or what a TV show pays well, because there's a you know the size of the house. Of the theater is limited. Yeah, there's a certain exactly. number of seats. Um, ideally, it sells out, but even then, that's a finite. It's a more and finite cash stream. I, what I would love to do is, uh, like, if I knew that Expanse was coming back and I was going to be on eight episodes, mm-hmm. I'd be like, you know what? When Expanse is over, I'm going to take two months off and go do a play for five hundred bucks a week because mm-hmm. who cares? Right. Because at that point, you made enough money to live the whole year. Right. Until that opportunity presents itself, I don't think I'm going to be doing the stage anytime soon. Um, okay, so dummy questions about um, at starting up an acting career in Canada. 
Um, what, what's the guild? Is it the same? The, uh, the union? It's not the same. The union here, we have ACTRA. Uh-huh. I have no idea what it stands for. I uh-huh. guess something Canadian, something <laughs> theater, I'm guessing. So does it, cover, does it cover screen? Yeah, and stage? screen, stage, real voice, covers everything. Okay. Uh, there is a stage union also. Uh-huh. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I haven't done that. Um, and there's SAG-AFTRA in the States, obviously. Mm-hmm. And they do have some things that they uh, they work together on some things. Um, but for the most part, if you're an actor, a Canadian actor solely, you don't have a SAG membership or vice versa. But you can have both. Right. So yeah. what does it take then to get into ACTRA? Uh, it takes six credits okay. to get into ACTRA. That's the catch twenty two of being an actor, and I'm sure it's the same for saying. Same for writing, it's, same for everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's you have to book a union job to get a union card, mm-hmm. but to get a union job, you have to be a union member. Right. It's the catch twenty two. Right. What it essentially has to happen is a company has to find a kind of film a film producer director whoever has to find that you're the only one who can play this role, and then has to go to the union and say. Well, I only want him or her. Mm-hmm. And then the union say, okay, we'll give her the union card. And then you have to buy into the union uh-huh. for the most part. Uh, but it's not, I mean, that sounds a lot more difficult than it is. I've never known somebody to not get in the union. Right. Uh, well, because they need new talent they're... all the time. I mean. Yeah, yeah, people always want new talent. People always want new faces. So uh, it's not that hard. The you start off at least here. You start off as an apprentice until you get to six, and then it's actually it's a great union. Uh, it's a great union, and I have great benefits. And I'll always get my check and go look at all this money that they take. Mm-hmm. And you, you're like, oh, why they take that much? But then a year from now, I look at my RSPs and go, oh, okay, that's why. Mm-hmm. You know, they're very good at that kind of uh, that kind of stuff. They really take care of their actors, I'm sure. So what Sorry, what sure kinds of, what kinds of benefits do they provide? Pretty much anything. I mean, uh, their dental covers, I think, 80%. Uh, massages. Nice. Yeah, because they look at it as an active thing. You need to be relaxed. And, yeah. You know, chiropractics, things like that. Um, I mean, in Canada, healthcare is, for the most part, free, so right. we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. I mean, free. We pay taxes, but right. you yeah. have to pay when you go. Yeah, uh, yeah I've... I've I think there's like a rental car thing in there somewhere. <laughs> and and uh, it's more straightforward than to book jobs once you're in the union, is what you're basically saying. Yeah, and once you're in the and once you're in the union, as long as you have a good agent that gets you in the rooms and you're good. Mm-hmm. What I found, what I found is that, and this is true everywhere, not just in Canada, is that once you get to know the people who make the movies, the casting directors and the producers, it really doesn't matter who your agent is. It matters after you book the job to get you the best deal, right. to get you the best billing and all that stuff. Right. But once you're, once you know a casting director, that casting director knows you, they're going to call you in if they think you're right for the part. Occasionally they'll forget about you and that's where you, you're like, hey, why didn't, why am I not being seen for this to your agent? Mm-hmm. Your agent will call them and they're like, yeah, they'll bring you in. But for the most part, especially here, I know every casting director in Canada. Mm-hmm. And if one of them thinks I'm good for a part, I'll get a call to at least audition for it. I'll pop myself on tape for it or whatever. Um, but that took 10 years. And then do you, do you reach a point, or does an actor reach a point in their career where they don't have to do a whole lot of auditions anymore? Sometimes. It's it's pretty rare. Uh, it's You have to be in like really top tier to not ever audition. Okay. Like, um, like a Tom Hanks or a Robert Downey Jr.? Yeah, and even Robert Downey Jr., I mean, I mean, it's Iron Man, so it's a huge film, but he had to, there's his audition tape is online, okay. auditioning for Iron Man, and this is Robert Downey Jr. before, yes. even before he was Iron Man, he was pretty freaking famous, yeah. and he still has to audition. That He probably, that's not to say people give Robert Downey Jr. jobs all the time, right. um, but uh, for someone like me, for the most part, I have to audition. Actually, I almost always have to audition, but I have a lot of friends in the business. There's like a show called Alphas that I did uh-huh. where I played the bad guy for a whole season. And uh, the guy who directed that first film I told you about, he became the showrunner of that show. So he called me and he's like, I want you on the show. 
we'll find a part for you. You still have to audition, but right. find a part for you. Found a part for me. I auditioned. I'm sh- I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but I'm sure he said, I want this guy on the show. Right. He had to prove that I was good through my audition tape. Mm-hmm. But that kind of thing happens more often than straight up offers, mm-hmm. especially in Canada. Straight up offers are very rare. I know Canadian actors who have no one, who you know, who have been in big American films. And I'm not talking like Jim Carrey or Mike Myers. Right, but, but yeah. You know, uh, who I bump into at auditions. I'm like, why are you auditioning? <laughs> Wouldn't somebody just know you're great at this? And right. just say, but, you know, they don't, they just, everybody kind of auditions for a long, long time. You you for sure get your leg in the door a lot sooner right. the more you work. Right. Uh, and the more producers know you and the more, right. you know, things like that. It, it happens. And you know what's funny? Twitter is a very interesting thing. Oh, really? Because you start getting like a massive excuse me, you start amassing a big following because of the shows that, that you do. And then I at least start getting directors that are following me. Oh, wow. I'll immediately, I'll immediately follow them back, of course. Right. And, and then occasionally, you know, I'll get an audition. I've done it. I've got an audition, right? I'll direct message the guy who followed me and go, hey, I'm, I'm seeing you tomorrow. And he's like, yeah, do this, 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 and this. Wow. You know, kind of thing. So it's a new... It's a new world. Well, I, I noticed that most actors had Twitter accounts, but I didn't realize there was any professional, anything outside of building a fan base. Well, here's yeah. something, and I've been told this, so for actors watching this, I've been told that now producers will go see if you have a following on Twitter. They'll go see if you have a Facebook following. Because this very popular thing now of live tweeting with the cast mm-hmm. of the show... If you have 20,000 followers, that's 20,000 more people that might be watching the show. Right. So people like, producers like that. Mm -hmm. And they see if you have a following, they want you to. And also, you know, it's just good to have a Twitter account if you're an actor anyway. Mm -hmm. It's good for promotion. Good. I mean, it it is all basic, unabashed self-promotion. Well, it's a publicity platform, and I mean, it's the it's same it. with writing Let's too. I mean, if you have a, if you have a good, if you have a, you know, a million Twitter followers, you are more likely to get that publisher contract over yeah, somebody exactly. who might have, you know, an equally competently written novel. Without that, I mean, that's just. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just the, the way of the world now. It's. Um, um, how far in advance are you usually booked for work, or, um, do you normally know like the whole next year what you're doing, or is it more? Oh God, no, no, no. For, uh, for all intents and purposes, after like the end of November, I'm unemployed. Right. You know, like I know, I have people. For example, I have a guy who's on a show who shoots in Vancouver. Who said I wrote a part for you? Shoots in December. They'll call you to audition. So in the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, I'll probably get that in December. Mm-hmm. Never guaranteed. Right. I got another guy who, who's doing another video game. And he's like, oh, I got the perfect part for you. Clear your January schedule. Sure. Mm-hmm. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Right. Especially with video games, things. So it's like any contract work. It's like construction. It's like uh, any sort of paint or anything like that. You get, you get your contract. You finish your contract. You hope for the next contract. That's what it is. So it sounds like you need um, personality traits beyond just um, being a good actor. I mean, it sounds like it helps to be able to, you know, save money and um, be comfortable yeah. working sort of from month to month and and things like that. I mean, is that something you basically just need to cultivate if this is the kind of job that you want? Absolutely. It's very hard, especially when you start out, because. Here's the bad thing is you'll get a check and your checks for, let's say, 500 bucks. And out of that, you got to put money away for taxes. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you may not be able to pay rent. Right. If you don't, in five years, you're going to be in big trouble. Right. Because the tax people, the IRS is going to be calling you and be like, you owe us $10,000 now. Right. Yeah, that kind of thing. Uh that happened to me because I, when I first started acting, I would get my checks and my agent would write on them, put away 45% for taxes. Mm-hmm. I was like, if I do that, I can't eat. Right. So I'm not doing that. And that was my justification for it, right? Mm-hmm. And then It's a good justification. Yeah, to a degree. <laughs> yeah. I but suppose yes. I could have been more careful. And then I, uh, I got caught and then by suddenly I was getting calls like, you owe a lot of money. And then I had to start working on payment plans. It was a big, crazy headache. 
Very, uh, very common for writers to run into as well. I don't doubt it. Yeah, writers, same thing. Writers is contract business, right? Yeah. There's, you know, there's always the stereotype that the arts are a way to make rain and make a whole lot of money. But what people don't realize is even when, you know, a writer gets gets a huge contract, you know, they, they'll, they'll make like a $40,000 advance or a $400,000 advance, but people don't take into account that it took them 10 years to write the book and they yeah. don't know when their next contract is coming. And so even when you're doing well, you can't let yourself live like you're doing too well just because you don't know. Yeah, I mean, work. you never know. I mean, yeah, I, I've done better every year than the last. Right. Like every crossed, January 1st, I go, out. is this the last one? Right. It's like, is this where it starts going downhill? Right. But it's the same for any real estate, anything. Right. That kind of it's like same thing. Right. It, people have a romantic view of the arts when, you know, in a way our sort of our payment and our lifestyle is just yeah. as pedestrian as you know, a lot of yeah. contract I, I, I mean, you're a freelancer. Think my friends on Facebook that I grew up with or I went to school with, be like, man, you must be rich. And I'm yeah, like, right. Okay, I'm not rich yeah. by any means. If I don't work for three months, I'm going to really start worrying. Well, and if you are rich, it's like I have, that means you have a good war chest. It <laughs> doesn't mean you're driving the Ferrari, you know. Yeah, You've got exactly. to make more than your lawyer counterpart yeah, before you yeah. buy the Ferrari because you just don't know <laughs> yeah, what's coming. Yeah, true. Yeah. But that's what it is. And, and you know what? I don't, I, I mean, everybody wants more money. But uh, I don't really want anything more than what I'm doing in terms of uh, I just want to be a working actor right. for as long as I can. Right. I'm not right. looking to be famous. I think that's the wrong way to look at acting. Right. Like, oh, I want to be a bit, I want to do the red, I hate red carpets. But do, is, it, is it an advantage um, doing so much video game work to be able to get a lot of work <coughs> without necessarily getting famous? Because fame... Looks like a yeah. rough ride. It really does. I have to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, b based on the the. Yeah, it's. It depends what, right? Like, if you're looking at some, what what I where I want to be known is is by people in the business. Right. That's the only people I want to really know me. Right. Um, that's not to say I would reject. Right. Like I said, I do a lot of conventions. Right. So I need a lot of. I always hesitate to use the words fans because they're not fanatical. Mm -hmm. like I always meet right. a lot of people who know my work and I love them and appreciate them. And and, uh, and because of people like them, uh, more people talk about me, the more work I get. Right, but you don't have them knocking on your door at 3 o'clock in the morning no. with a six-pound ba bag of gummy bears. And yeah, that's actual stuff that's happened to <laughs> people I know who've gotten famous of. So any particular advice for people who, who want to be actors? I, you know, I think it, it should go without saying, but it doesn't always, like, learn to act. Um, people don't necessarily take the training into account in the arts, I find. It's, there's too many stories Especially of... TV, yeah. Yeah, of, you know, just having this wild talent. Um, whereas, in your experience, how many actors do you know without formal training? Most. Yeah. Yeah. They all take classes... And they all, they all go. Oh, I'm going to get a coach for this audition. And in my experience, the best actors are the ones that were trained, like really trained. Mm -hmm. like went into theater school. I mean, you don't necessarily have to go to theater school, but right. like, go do play, go for free. You know, go do uh, just learn as much as you can from as many people you can. Yes, take classes. Yes, get coaches. But a lot of, here's another catch-22, is that when you go to theater school, you don't learn, you don't learn anything about working in TV and film. Right. Uh, you learn about theater. But you do learn about character breakdown, and you do learn about uh, emotional, emotional like, uh, expression and things like that, the, you know, the cliche stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, when, you, when you do uh, class, acting classes you learn mostly about how to get the job on TV. Right. And they're both important. Mm -hmm. I, had, I never took acting classes. I took theater school, and then I, I just went to the real-life school of learning how to audition. Right. Learning what worked, what I booked, what I didn't book. Right. I said this to my agent the other day. This is, I think, good advice. Is, uh, I know that I can play almost anything. Mm -hmm. Almost anything that, I, that if I fits my age range... Mm -hmm. And my my sex and my right. race, right. I can play it. Right. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna book it. Right. 
is a big difference. Uh, I know what I book, and I know what I don't book. Even though I'm always going to do a good job, mm-hmm. doesn't mean I'm going to get the job. Right. And then I'll watch the person who got the job and be like, yep, I can see why they wouldn't have cast me. They right. cast, I don't have that. Mm-hmm. Not a talent thing, it's just I don't have that style. I don't have that look. I know what my style is and what I look. Right. So I know how to go into auditions now and go, or I get an audition and my agent goes, oh, well, you want to do this? I'm like, I'm not going to book that. Mm-hmm. I'll still go in and do it if I have the time. Right. Because like, Expanse is a perfect okay. example. Oh, yeah. Never, but TV work for working actors like mm-hmm. me is, it happens so quickly. Uh-huh. So, like, when you audition for a role, it's shooting in three weeks maximum. Right. Most of the time, if it's a guest star, it's like next week. Mm-hmm. So what bothers me about that is like, if I had known, and this guy's supposed to be really big and muscly, mm-hmm. if I had four weeks, I can get into right. four or six weeks, I can get into that shit. Right. Or if I need to be heavier, or if I need to be thinner. Right. Like you don't have that luxury when you're right. working actor. Like you're just like, if you fit the part, you fit the part. Right. That's why I like video games too. Yeah. Yeah. How much do they alter your appearance, typically? Sometimes they... I mean, like, Jensen is not designed after my face, Mm -hmm. but once they cast me, you can see me in the character, Mm -hmm. because they're basing it... It's like you can see Andy Serkis in Gollum. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, now if you see Andy Serkis acting, you're like, okay, I see, yeah. Yeah, you see Gollum. So it's the same type of thing. It's like Jensen was designed way before I came along. But then once they started, uh, uh, once I started performance capturing him, you could see my, you see my face in his. We kind of look similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I did one called Splinter Cell Blacklist, where they made him look like me at like fifty five. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes it's you, and they have to, you know, they have to pay you to use your license. Right. If they, Usual license. Like, likeness. Likeness. Yeah. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's really cool. Sometimes I don't get anything like you. Well, well sometimes cry. they're not even human, are they? I mean, you know. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an alien. How much are you uh, involved in the launches of the video games? Because, like, you know, movies, the, the cast do a press junket, you know, they're, they walk the red carpet for their premieres. What, what's the process like for a video game? Uh, well, we, uh, similar um, now. Yeah. Like I said earlier, we're trying to get like a kind of a star system in mm-hmm. in video games. Now you know, like this year, I've been all over the all over the U.S. doing all sorts of conventions. Yeah. February is gonna be the craziest month. All the Kenzo stuff from Expanse and those two games. So also the coldest and shortest month. So it sounds like, yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks, Emily.